for my sake will find it. Today, uh, if you can put my slide up there, brother, for my title today, I'll be speaking on the focal point today, not for the faint of heart. If you'll bow your heads as we go to the Lord in a quick word of prayer to bless His Lord and to prepare ourselves to receive from His um, from the, the teachings and the, the, the preaching this morning. To God say, Father, God, I thank you for this morning. God, I thank you for your word that has wonderful encouragement, God, but it's also a book that challenges us to change, to refine, to better ourselves, to think differently about the world, to be mindful of our current state, and to push towards a better mark and high calling that we have, God, to pursue to be like you. God, this morning I pray, God, that you would anoint my mind, my physical throat, my body, my spirit, that I would once again be able to preach your word only as you would have me to preach it, dear Father. Not one word too many or too less, but just what you would have me to deliver to your people. And that, God, I pray for the hearts and minds of every man and woman in the room, believer or, or unbeliever, dear Father, that you would help them to receive from your word, to be challenged and encouraged, but also know that, God, the truths of his word are meant to push us to be better because our Father in heaven loves us. God, we thank you for your word this morning and let it be once again received by your people. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. The way of Christ is not for the faint of heart, like I said. So be kind of our focal point for today. Today's going to be a very message of challenge. So uh, hang on to your hats, hold on to your bootstraps. Whatever the fr There's many phrases about it, so just... Uh, Hang in there with me. See, to effectively follow the difficult path that Christ has set before us, we must count the cost and receive strength and power from the Holy Spirit. You see, this passage continues Jesus' commissioning of the 12 apostles that we've studied a little bit earlier in last week's sermon. Um, so this is still its own separate sermon, but kind of a, and can also have some continuation there. Where Christ both sends and equips His disciples for mission. You see, the passage begins with words of preparation and words of caution in verses 24 and 25. You see, Jesus does not want his followers to be unaware of the persecution and adversity that lie ahead. All those who claim the name of Christ will be maligned like he was. If people ridiculed him, people will surely do the same to his followers. If he was treated with contempt, we will be also but when you face persecution, be sure to examine, though, the reason you are receiving these negative reactions. Be it, are you acting Christ-like, or are you acting in an ungodly way and still receiving backlash? That keeps you focused so you don't become self-righteous. Like I said, this is going to be an interesting message today, but just love your pastor for giving it to you anyway. There are some general rules for the Lord's disciples. You see in these rules, there's some natural human conflict. But let's dive in to look at them together. They, as the believers, must be patient in looking unto Jesus. You see, Jesus is our example. He's our master. He's our Lord. He is in all things above us immeasurably and beyond comparison. In His divine power and majesty, there's a transcendent holiness and there's a perfect love that God is. But, as Scripture denotes about Jesus' walkings here on the earth, He was despised and rejected of men. So in, su in such like way, his people must ex expect the exact similar treatment. In a lot of ways, people like to ask me, Pastor, why do bad things happen to us? We're good people. We're believers. But you live in a fallen world. So some things are just going to happen because of that fallen nature. And let me be very clear. The Bible does not say you will have a, a good life, a perfect life, a, an altogether life because you're a believer. If you've been fed that lie, I apologize for you being fed that. But I encourage you that while there is hard truth that we'll hear today, it's backed by a God who will be with you through it all and lovingly walk with you through it all. You see, we must not look for the high places of the world because our Lord endured the cross. We must not look for praise when Jesus received cruelly insults and things of that nature. We must expect that our best deeds will be misrepresented at times. I will tell you in my life, people often, their first reaction to me when I pay a compliment, say a kindness, is I must want something 
or they want to know why I said it. I've had a few experiences already in there, and some of those shopkeepers already know who here comes that pastor, um, where I will say a kind encouragement, and they first met me, they say, they, they're like, oh, you don't mean that. And I looked at them, and I go, why do you think I don't mean it? And I smiled. And they go, well, people, people don't mean things like that. And I said, well, I do, and I'm glad to, because like one, one thing I was, I simply looked at them, and I said, I'm glad to see you today. They said, you're not glad to see me. I said, I'm glad to see you today. And I've also paid compliments. Um, I'm going to lovely call you out, sis, but it's all good. I often remind Judy how much I love her. She's one of our, our lovely people that's in there. And I always remind Judy how, much, how lovely she looks. And because, you know what? We as the body should encourage each other. Also, Judy, I give what I like to receive. So when you, when you encourage me, 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 and Judy, me and Judy are encouragement buddies. It's all right. Uh, John, you, you have a wonderful wife, brother. She encourages her pastor. It's all good stuff. Um, but see, what's good about that is, let's be honest, the world will discourage you often. If not for your beliefs, they'll just discourage you. I don't know about many of you, but as many kids as I've talked to, talked to here, because I, and also in America, by the way, I was a kids pastor for a number of years as also a youth pastor of the Del Tanders. And the biggest problem that I heard from both groups there, but also my chaplaincy here in Scotland, is how often people are just negative, kids to kids. How much bullying happens. I, don't, I, don't, I can't tell me times I've heard parents call me and say, Pastor, please pray. My daughter's being bullied. My son's being bullied. They're being told they're stupid. They're ugly. They're, the list goes on. There's some more ugly words I want to share right now. And it's, the thing for me I want to tell you is the world will tell them that they are less than. But God's word does not tell them they are less than. God's Word paints a different picture of the things that we are to speak life into to each other. Now, don't get me wrong. Are we all fallen sinners? Absolutely. But you are also fearfully and wonderfully made and bear the image of a Creator who loved you enough to intentionally make you. I can tell you, becoming a, an earthly father gives you a whole different perspective on, 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 on some of the things you read in Scripture. I have four very distinctly different but also similar daughters. And in parenting them, you come to find the differences God put in them is innate by his, by his design. And so there are times as a father, I, my prayers are often, God, help me parent them to how you've made them. Because you've formed them with purpose. I'll give you an example. My older two daughters, Lily, who you saw earlier, and then Elliot. Lily is a... That girl is probably the most detailed thinker you'll meet. And I, I say that of even some adults I've met. No offense, adults. She just is, she's just something else. That girl can look at something and about take it apart mathematically. But see, the thing is, in her life, that's held her back. There's times as a child approaching a playground area that she looks at a slide. No, I can't do that. I said, why, baby? She said, it's too high. I said, why is it too high? And she'll explain to me in her little words why it's too high and explain what would happen if she failed. And I said, what child knows that? But she does. But I've had times where it's been good parenting moments. Now, Elliot, my second born, is also a fun little conundrum. That girl would look at a slide and go, I can climb up that thing. I can slide down that thing. I might even slide, go halfway down and then climb back up again. Elliot is fearless, but Elliot is also my most emotional of my four children. But what's beautiful about that picture is Elliot has this empathy that I remind her is God-given. My baby from as many as years back when she first started being, you know, sitting up bigger. And I mean, because she's, she's seven now, but like even when she was four and five, maybe even three, that girl's, her emotions are amazing. And I tell her, like, they're, they're beautiful. God gave you these baby. She could watch something on TV. And there's, a, there's an example I can remember you guys may know a number of years ago was the, the movie The Greatest Showman, where there's a scene where the boy is slapped. And she looked at me and she said, Daddy, we don't do that. But she's turned, and the moment she saw it, a, a moment later, Baby girl starts wheeling up. She starts crying. She said, Daddy, we don't do that. That's not how we treat people. And I said, baby, you're right. So we won't do that, right? But that girl is moving empathy. And I remind her that God gave her that gift because in being empathetic, that baby girl is going to be a prayer warrior like none other. She's going to walk her room and she's going to know some things. It's going to be okay. And she's going to be moved. And she's going to want to cry a lot of times. But I go, baby, it's okay. Give those emotions to God. Give those needs to God. Those people you see mistreated, you encourage, but then you take that thought away and you go, God, take care of this person. Just so you know, because I, and I, once again, I'm her father, I can toot her horn, and I love how God uses his children. This morning, before any of you got here, my baby girl walked up to my office when I was, once again, re reviewing my sermon, and she asked about the people who would come today. I said, baby, give me your hand. I said, let's, let's pray for them. And she said, good, Daddy. 
And then she walked down. That's all. all the, but she knew that you would need prayer this morning. My seven-year-old knew. Now, you could take that as a proud father, and I am proud. They're not perfect. But I say that to, say, to encourage you to this. God's meticulous purpose and plan of you means there are ways you can affect change, spread the gospel, and love people that is unique and, and powerful to you. Don't look at somebody else the way they're producing. You do as God leads you, but once again, you must abide in Him to understand how He wishes for you to move properly. It's a powerful picture when we, when we are operating in the call, big and small, but purposeful that God calls us to. And you see, but along the way, once again, there are things that will maybe be misrepresented, like I said, but still you must pursue, per- pursue and persist forward. You see, even when you do those good things and people think differently of you, The important thing is that you must pursue further knowing that they may react that way but not to let that be a negative thought towards them but to be, I'm going to love them more. I'm going to pray for them more. I'm going to show them more Jesus. Not that it's going to be deterrent but push forward in the way you treat them in a better way. You see, it's good for Christians once again to be blamed though and you're like, oh, Pastor, that's weird. It's good because for us, it's a discipline of meekness. It leads us once again to looking deeper into the heart of God to also though, also to examine ourselves to understand our sin and shortcomings so that we may better serve the Master and that God once again may refine us as we understand His suffering in our own. Number two is the duty of holy boldness. You see, suffering becomes a blessing if it makes men become like God. Therefore, once again, when you see Scripture say, do not fear or fear not, this command, once again, is actually a word of gracious encouragement. Because He knows we're human, we get shaken by stuff. But fear not. Don't let the world, the devil, other people discourage from what I have said. That's what God wants to remind you of. You see... I also want to give the example. So when a couple, for instance, takes a a prenatal or birthing class. See, the labor and delivery nurse teaching the course is there to help prepare them for the difficulty or challenges that may lie ahead in birthing a child. A good registered nurse will not shield or shelter a couple from potential roadblocks or things to happen. You see, nurses, once again, will do all they can to make sure that the student, or once again, in this case, the future parents, are not caught off guard or blindsided by the risks or complications of childbirth. So like a good delivery nurse, Jesus is preparing his followers and us by connection for the difficult road ahead in this passage. Not pulling punches or once again even mincing words, but being very honest with us. Do you know what actually I want to encourage you? While this passage is hard to read, Jesus trusted his disciples and by us by association enough to be brutally honest with them. I don't know about you, but I like honesty. Now you're like, well, be careful if I ever, maybe if I'm ever honest with you, Pastor, just tell you. Um, but is that, if I tell you something, it's what I believe. My wife likes to remind me, and I tell her, shh, don't, don't, don't pump me up. That's, I guess that's our job, she reminds me. Is She says, if you meet Luke, he's the same guy in front of you or behind you, whether you're around or not around, because I just, I love honesty. So when you think I'm rose-coloring something or I'm really encouraged, no, I just, I believe the words I say. So much so that I've gathered those kids that are up in Sunday school before her here in the altar, and I've looked them in the eye and go, by the way, you're a mighty woman. You're a mighty man of God. And I believe our kids can change the world. But you know what I also believe? I believe you can. And I'm quirky. You can just smile and love me anyway. God made me this way. It's all right. Is that I believe that because I believe the God that I serve who can do anything. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not changed it's a beautiful picture that His love means that God loved that He made me this quirky so that I can be as encouraging and make you laugh. But guess what? There's times that you'll laugh, but you'll remember my sermon points later because of it. Don't believe me? I have people tell me stuff later. They're like, oh, good, that stuck. Glad to hear that. And so I say that in the fact that God wants to remind you of the intentionality of what's going to happen by the, His support that's encouraging, but the honesty of what may happen. You see, for those of you who have been believers for a number of years, you know this to be true. Preaching to the choir, if you will, in that way. But I want to encourage you also is the duty of trustfulness is another focal point here. See, God's mercy is over all His works. He cares for His creatures, the smallest ones, and ones that we think is insignificant. 
He cares even more for those precious souls, meaning us, that, his, that Jesus the Redeemer came, came to die for. You see, the smallest circumstances of our lives are not beneath His notice. Therefore, once again, we must trust that the Almighty Protector, God, once again knows. If He knows about the sparrow, once again, He knows about us. You see, for that matter, we should not fear persecution. We shouldn't fear sickness, pain, or death. Because once again, none of these things actually separates us from the love of God. Do you know how we get separated from those hard times? The person wearing your shoes. Or if you're not wearing shoes, the person wearing your clothes. Because we let those opportunities of hard make us step back instead of push in. I've, uh, I've been through some various in interesting seasons of my life. I've had, by the way, loss as well, just like us all, before I give you this encouragement. But there were times that my parents poured enough into me that I was a, uh, so I was a high school child, so secondary school. In the ninth grades, I probably was, what, 15, 14, 15 years old. When I got some very hard news about my father, who, by the way, almost died. But that's a whole other story for another day. That, but that's, that's connected with what I'm going to say here. But do you know what my first reaction was? I said, have we prayed about it? Now, that's not to be like, ooh, yay, Pastor Luke. Because was I crying while I said it? Yes. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not you know, unemotional that I may lose my father because they told him that he would die that day. By the way, it's, that's been years ago. He lived. So be encouraged. God can meet your needs. When, when the when doctor says it's impossible, <laughs> they don't know my God. So there's things that he, he'll show up and show out. But my first reaction to my brother who picked me up from school was, have we prayed yet? And he said, no, I haven't been there yet. And so what was what my, my, a memory that I have, and it's funny what, I, what a teenage kid keeps in their head, I remember... Walking into the hospital room, my mother, my two older brothers, and myself grabbing hands and circling my dad and starting to pray. And in that moment, I also noticed, because I'm a kid, the awkwardness of the doctors and nurses who kind of backed up. But yet, what else I noticed besides their awkwardness, because they almost didn't know what to do with themselves, was an awe in the eyes of people that a family would stop what they're doing when told that daddy's going to die. We were all wailing and busting at the seams. We were, it's time to give it to God. Because we can't do anything about it. Man said he's going to die in the next few hours. He's going to die. Today's the day. His number's up. But praying together knowing that God has to be in control. If God takes him, God help me. <laughs> but God, if, if you it be your will, I believe you can heal him. God did heal him. That's a fun story. We should talk later. For the sake of time, I'm not going to tell you that one right now. But I say that to encourage you, the fact that the God of the universe intentionally holds you right here. Even when it seems like your things are falling apart, just hold tighter to him. Dig a little deeper. Hold a little closer. Because God will take you through it if you rely and abide on him, in, in, in him. You see, circumstances of life really are small, but we let them to be these big things that just encumber our minds. Therefore, once again, we must trust that the protector and the almighty God, once again, as he knows us, knows of what we are going through. You see, with looking at oh, the best way to, to go against any of these conflicting uh, human emotions, is looking to what the scripture tells us. And so scripture reminds us that we must count the cost because as we know, there will be things we must go through. And for what we must know is that once again, our whole life once again must be something about drawing closer to Him and being ready to submit to Him at all costs. You see, the, our reward once again will be great in heaven, but we don't do it for that reward. The reward that we also do it for, though, while wow, that is a great one, by the way, I'm, I'm glad to go to heaven too, um, is that... My goal is to take as many people as I can. If I didn't believe in this gospel, I wouldn't have come across an ocean. That's not even mean, that's not being, not being self-righteous, it's being honest with you. I wouldn't have taken my four babies and said, hey, we're going to go somewhere that's not America. Hang on with daddy and it's going to be all right. I, because uh, also when we first got the call, and I do mean not the literal call, I mean when I was on an altar when this happened, um, 
And I got up and went, went over to my wife, Micah, my two-year-old, was of course not two-year-old, she was like fresh. Um, and so my wife was like, eh, we're going to do what? Okay. But you know what's really cool about God? God, the little things matter to Him. And in this case, the little being my wife's heart, which probably wasn't very little in this case, but I'm just, I am want to tell you, the emotions she was feeling were important to her. So you know what's funny about God? God led me to a couple across the way that we walked over to. And, it, and I didn't know them, by the way, but God led me to them. And, and as I'm talking to this couple, they look at each other and smile, and they look at us, and they look at each other and smile. And then the, the wife steps forward and starts to speak into, my li- into, into the heart and life of my wife. And my wife told me afterward that every fear she had had about it, every anxiety that popped in her head, every what if, God spoke to in that moment, saying basically, daughter, it's all right. I know you have them. You're okay to feel those feels. It's okay. But I'm going to hold you right here. It's going to be all right. And if I, if I called you, I'll equip you. If I called you, I'll, t- I'll make the way. If I called you, you may come against human sides of things, but I am God. Let me, let me be God. You don't need to be God. You don't need to figure it out. I got this figured out. And two months later, we're in Scotland. I don't know about you. Um, I'll make a joke because it's kind of funny because you all in some situation have connection with this. Um, some things with the Scottish government or governmental things or agencies you call, they take their sweet time about certain things. So two months is really good. We got over here real quick. Got our visas all sorted. All things good. Um, and God made the way for us to be here. And the cool thing is there has been hard times since we've been here. That's not what I'm preaching on. And the fact that I say this, God is good. God is faithful. If you lean on Him, it's all right. Just so you know, your pastor's been discouraged in this last year. There's been moments. There's been times where I felt um, really bad about a lot of number of things. Because the devil would like nothing more than to, to discourage me enough that my tail goes between my, my, my legs as a dog and I go back to America. But that's not where I'm going. I, I told the devil long ago, uh, in April before August, so... Uh, it's been over a year now, um, but last uh, last April when I visited the church first, the the members of the church who were here didn't know I had this moment of prayer because before you met me fully and I had I had prayer before I preached to you all before you voted me to come. Um, I, I looked I look I had a moment with God about mm, right there on that floor, and I uh, had a moment where I was like <laughs> I can't do this. I know you call me God, but I, I, I. and um, at one point I looked at him and I said you're going to have to do this. You're gonna have to give me the strength when I need it, but I'm but but and I list all things. But then, but then I stopped myself after listening all these like God, you're gonna to have to. And I said, I said, but God, if you don't, if I get weak, if I get weary, though you slay me, yet will I serve you. I don't know the future, God. Daddy wants to know it all so I can make sure my babies are safe. So I can make sure all the things are planned and figured out. I want to know where all the finances are going to come from, where all the things are going to line up. But I said, God, I'm going to follow the end. No stipulations. No what ifs. Every high and every low. And I'm going to leave my people to do the same because at the end of the day, we have to get to the point where this isn't just what we do on Sundays. I love you. Keep coming. But the fact of the matter is, if you come just because it's Sunday, because it's a good thing to do, you are here for the wrong reason. I will be very frank with you. I believe there are people in here who are capable. You know, people will make the comment, well, there are 11 men, 12 men, if you will, that turned the world upside down, which were the disciples. I believe there are people in here that can change Nairn for forever. There are people in Nairn who need to hear the gospel too. But I also preach them that there are people in Scotland and there are people who come here on holiday that need to take the word back to where they come. And so I tell you to tell, to tell you this, you must release it all to him. As a person who, who, who likes to plan everything, to have things figured out, I, 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 I understand your, your, your hesitancy. But this Christ-like life that, we, life that we're called to is one of total surrender. Don't worry. I'm encouraged by the fact that in his word, in John chapter 16, verse 33, it says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. 
By the way, um, I know this is English translation, but to give you some a little bit of back knowledge, the original words there when it says will have, it means definite. <laughs> Just to make sure you know it is being honest. You will have tribulation. But what I love, though, is the cancellation of that word but there in the original language to remind you, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Which means at the end of the day, I don't need to rely on my own ability, understanding, strength, finances, whatever the list that can be. Whatever you think you're relying on today, you can... And it's released and relinquished to Him. Because I've sat across the table from various ministers here in, in, in there. And we've had moments of prayer together. But I've had moments where, I, where my fellow ministers have looked at me and said, I don't know what's going to happen to the faith, Pastor Luke. I've watched it deteriorate over the last number of years. And I said, well, on our watch, are you going to let it die? They said, well, no. I said, no, no, no. Are you going to let the faith die? Because first of all, are you in control of the faith? And he said, most, most of these men have said, well, no. I said, who's in control of the faith? They said, well, God. I said, well, if God is in control of the faith, it won't die. But what I need you to do is I need you to believe that as long as you are pursuing forward, that if everyone in Nairn stops pursuing the faith, if you don't, the faith won't die. Which means as long as you're the one, you'll be all right. The faith will be all right. Now, one thing, the good thing is you don't have to rely on your own ability to keep being the one. But the fact is that God has a purpose and a plan. But you just got to follow when he says, lead, when, he follow, when, he, when he leads you, you just got to follow him forward. So just a few lessons in, in kind of totality to look here is that we must be content to go through stuff, to look, be looked down upon or despised as the master was, knowing that once again we are his disciples following the plan he lays out. Our fear for God means that we should fear for nothing but to be bold in bearing witness to the truth of God and his word. You see, God cares for us in all of our trials, big or small, and we should bring them all before Him in trustful prayer. We're going to talk about that in just a second as we go into altar time. What must be understood overall is that we can live a blessed life. There will be some things along the way that's also going to happen. But I remind my children, the fact that they woke up this morning, have food on their table, have clothes on their back, the fact that they are doing what they're you are already blessed bigger than a bigger chunk of the world. You are more blessed than you realize. But the fact is, I will tell you this very honestly and frankly, and not to boast on me, but boast on God, is I have still, there's been times where my, my bank accounts got low too, but I've always wanted for nothing. Food showed up. Money's appeared in my bank account. They, they don't have, they don't, the bank don't know how I got there. I go, hey, you don't know my God. Um, money's, you know, th things happen that God just shows His faithfulness if we rely on Him to be faithful. And so I do want to encourage you that, like I said, in verse 34 through 39, once again, it talks about the counting of the cost. And as once again, as mentioned, you know, Jesus is not, once again, pulling punches here, but being honest. But I, what I want to be honest with you, though, is that God will make a way in difficult or in easy times to know that throughout it all, God will be with you as you move forward. As you bear the cross He's given you to bear, though as you do it obediently, it'll be worth it. I want to encourage you that counting that cost, the cost is worth it. And so, um, John, if you'll help me real quick, brother. As we go into our altar time today, we're going to do something a little uniquely different. Pass one out there by on that side. Just one. I'm passing out a, a piece of paper right now to everyone in the room. By the way, write in whatever is easiest. If you write in Russian, that's okay, or Ukrainian, or whatever you want to write in. Um, I'm, 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 pr I'm praying over this anyway, so it doesn't matter if it's English. <laughs> um, if you need a pen, I have a, I have a few that I'm going to let John pass out um, to write with. The Bible talks about a lot of different things. The Bible talks, talks about you have not because you ask not. The Bible talks about bringing your needs to Him before the Lord. 
Um, and like I said earlier, God cares about every trial we go through, big or small. We should bring them all before Him in trustful prayer. So what I want to encourage you right now is I pass out a slip to each of you. Um, and what I want you to do, and if you want more than one, I have more. By the way, if you have more than one need, you can always write it down. i got more papers up here. Um, but I want you to write down a need. This, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to fold them in half and put them in that box. Which means after service happens, that box is going to go upstairs. Ain't nobody going to see in this room. So here's why I want you to be honest, because some of you don't know me. Some of you know me pretty well. And somewhere in the thing in between. Um, but right now, I call you not to trust on me, which I am going to pray for them later, by the way. But what I, I want to encourage you with now is I want you to ask what you need from God. As if you are bringing them to an altar to Him. Now, I'm not God. But I'm going to take them to the throne for you and pray over them. So here's what I, I urge you. Because I, as I thought about this, I thought this, I was like, God, are they going to be honest? Here's what I want to encourage you. God desires your honesty and your openness. So here is what I will say. If you don't want yours read, still fold it in half, but right on the outside, don't read. Now, I hope you fold it up just fine and let me read them. But what I'm literally going to do, I'm going to take them out one at a time. I'm going to flip it over, see if I see words, and then I'm going to open and read it. If I, don't see word, if I see words say don't read, I'm going to graft it in my hand. I'm going to pray over it. And I'm going to personally make sure that every, all, all these papers are rubbished so that no one sees them. But I encourage you in, 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 in this, God desires you to bring your need. Because in a minute we're all going to pray. But I also want you to be honest with whatever the need is. Big, small, pretty or ugly, write your need out to Him. Because I've looked at people before who say, Pastor... Will you pray for me? And I, I say, yes, I can. I said, but have you prayed for yourself? Have you given your need to God yourself? And so I still pray for them, but I also want you to be honest and write out whatever the need is. If you have more than one need, like I said, I have more papers up here, please feel free to write one, fold it, put it in the box, and get another one and write, write another one. Um, what's funny to me, I'll give you a little encouragement, because I know you, uh, this, is, this is serious, by the way, but I'm trying to light and move because some of you are really, really serious looking. My Lily, my oldest, probably gives the most prayer requests in on midweek service, because I also have this box out usually. Um, and I was like, God, this is kind of weird. Why am I doing this on Sunday? But God's like, do it this way. Um, Lily usually puts five or six requests in there, everybody else puts like usually one. But Lily is aware that she's been taught prayer changes things because you pray to a God that changes things. Has the ability to do his will and way. So what I encourage you, have the faith of a child to write down whatever your need is, fold it up, and bring it. And so as you finish writing, go ahead and fold them and feel, feel free to come bring them and drop them in this box. And yes, if you're, if you're the first one or two, you already see Lily put one in this morning because she saw the box before even asking, filled one out and put it in the box. So she just, she knows, the, she, she understood the assignment, if you will. She knows. Um, but... and then we're going to pray together in a second.